Welcome to a new session of oral medicine and radiology series. Today we will be dealing with oral submucous fibrosis. Oral submucous fibrosis was earlier considered to be a part of pre-malignant conditions. And by that term, it means that the generalized state of the body where there is more tendency for malignancy to occur. So this term has now been discarded and another term has been used. That term is called as potentially malignant disorder. So both the pre-malignant condition as well as pre-malignant lesion come under the same terminology. So these terms have been removed. So oral submucous fibrosis is a disease which is easy to diagnose but extremely difficult to manage. Swartz was the person who first discovered it in 1952 and he named this entity as Atropica idiopathica mucosa oris. Maybe because by that time XI etiology was not found. So as we go through the historical reviews, we find that uh, the term oral submucous fibrosis was suggested by an Indian, Joshi, in 1952. And it's surprising that even though so many other terminologies have been suggested, we still uh, stick on to use uh, this particular term, that is oral submucous fibrosis. So coming to the definition, the definition was suggested by uh, Pinborg and Sirasid. Uh, it's a very long definition. Oral submucous fibrosis is an insidious chronic disease affecting any part of the oral cavity and sometimes the pharynx. Although occasionally preceded by vesicle formation, it is always associated with extra epithelial inflammatory reaction followed by a fibroelastic change of the lamina propria with epithelial atrophy leading to stiffness of mucosa and causing trismus and inability to eat. So by the definition, we understand that it is an insidious disease which means that it is very gradual in uh, formation. So since it's very gradual, we won't uh, discover it until it's it's too late. And then uh, this could be preceded by vesicle formation. Uh, but uh, it's always associated with uh, inflammatory reaction just beneath the epithelium, that is into the connective tissue. So there is deposition of collagen, uh, which later leads to stiffness of the mucosa and inability to eat and there is limited mouth opening. So coming to the epidemiology, uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, are uh, mostly affected by this particular uh, disease and uh, India is uh, one of those countries apart from Bangladesh, Pakistan etc. and it uh, affects almost uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 percent of the Indian population. Uh, the incidence is uh, rising, especially among the younger population, which is around uh, 20 to 40 years, it seems. Okay, the etiology is uh, multifactorial. Mm, there are certain local factors and systemic factors. Uh, however, uh, arachnid has been considered to be uh, the most potent uh, cause for uh, OSMR. There are certain reasons, I uh, will be taking that. Apart from arachnid, capsaicin, which is a component of chili, uh, then there's tobacco and alcohol, and systemic factors which include nutritional deficiencies, infections, autoimmunity, and genetic susceptibility. This nutritional deficiency has been uh, controversial because uh, some say that uh, the nutritional deficiency is the cause for uh, OSMR, whereas another school of thought uh, suggests that it's because of OSMR that there is a resulting nutritional deficiency. So this, this part is again uh, conflicting but still uh, it has been considered to be an etiological factor too. Coming to uh, the components of arachnid which actually uh, you know, take part in OSM of uh, pathogenesis. Uh, arachnid uh, consists of uh, certain components known as alkaloids, flavonoids, and others like uh, minerals, especially uh, copper. Uh, alkaloids uh, 
they consist of ericolin, ericidine, govacin, isogovacin, ericolidine, and govacolin. And then there are flavonoids like uh, tannins and capuchins, apart from other components. So the first two, that is alkaloids and flavonoids, are the uh, components which are uh, you know notorious, which are known to cause OSMS. So I'll be dealing with that. Uh, so as I told you before, uh, this particular uh, component, that is capsaicin, uh, it is found in chili and chili and peppers. Uh, this has also been uh, considered to be uh, a, a cause for uh, OSMF, a particular etiological factor for OSMF, uh, because uh, you know people who actually uh, consume a lot of uh, chilies, use a lot of spicy food, uh, have OSMF. But still, this is still controversial. You know, a lot of states like uh, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka where uh, chilies have been used more and more of spicy food have been used those places uh, have people most affected by OSMR so that's why this is also considered coming to uh, tobacco and alcohol again apart from uh, you know, other conditions like uh, cancer or leukoplakia this has also been attributed to uh, OSMF formation. However, uh, it is less potent than arachnid. Arachnid is known as the most potent of uh, etiological factors. The systemic factors uh, include nutrition deficiency, infections, autoimmunity, and genetic predisposition. Uh, even uh, Certain articles point out even five year old children have been affected by OSM. You know, so that actually points towards uh, autoimmunity and genetic predisposition. Nutritional deficiency, especially uh, depletion of iron stores and uh, vitamin D complex, uh, have been contributed to OSM formation. Especially the vitamin D complex uh, deficiency, it actually promotes. Uh, malignancy so uh, that is uh, more uh, towards uh, malignant transformation of OSM coming to the pathogenesis of uh, OSM so as I told you before arachnid uh, contains uh, basically alkaloids flavonoids and copper uh, the alkaloids uh, which I had uh, named earlier they stimulate fibroblast formation and uh, you know ab by fibroblast I mean abnormal fibroblast and, and they actually express genes gene expression is uh, stimulated and then there is increased production of uh, collagen you know than the normal rate there is more production of collagen then there are flavonoids uh, which cause increased cross linkage of collagen so what happens by that is uh, that uh, you know the collagen becomes more resistant and it it doesn't actually uh, dissolve or it it get, it doesn't get broken down and it becomes more uh, resistant to an enzyme which is known as collagenase which actually is an enzyme which causes lysis of the collagen so a lysis of collagen is required so that these bands can be removed. So, uh, during a normal process, there should be deposition as well as breakdown of collagen. However, in OSMF, what happens is that increased production of collagen and the removal of collagen is hampered. So, ultimately, you will have more and more of collagen deposition and no removal of collagen. Okay. Then, as I told you, there are minerals like copper and uh, arachnid which upregulates an enzyme which is called as lysyl oxidase so when you do that there is uh, more fibrinogenesis again there is more deposition and formation of fibrin sorry uh, deposition of collagen okay so together they produce this particular disease that is poison so after uh, you know OSMF begins to uh, you know, form 
or uh, you know form uh, there is juxta epithelial hyalinization which will happen that means there is deposition of collagen beneath the epithelium that is just beneath the epithelium yes. into the connective tissue the lamina propria level of the connective tissue so what happens is there are small tiny blood vessels which actually supply nutrients and other important factors to the epithelium so these blood vessels get obliterated because of excessive deposition of collagen so by that the blood supply is slowly slowly getting cut off and then due to continued chewing or over activity there is muscle contracture and both of these together they deplete the glycogen stores and which causes muscle fatigue and degeneration and which leads to fibrosis and scarring of muscle so what happens is the particular person becomes a fully fleshed oral submucous fibrosis patient okay so when there is vaso obliteration what happens is that the nutrition is also cut off and whatever by products or whatever things need to be removed from there that also is still getting removed okay coming to the clinical features as i told you the younger age is uh, uh, mostly affected because they tend to use gutka more gutka or arachnid more okay uh, this particular thing that is the sex is uh, controversial again because earlier the females were considered to be more affected by uh, osm of than males but there are conflicting evidences too because uh, it occurs in both ages sorry occurs in both sexes uh, our recent article suggests that there is a male dominance in compared to female so again there's conflicting evidence uh, coming to the site again uh, the buccal mucosa the retromolar trigone region soft palate and the palatal fossils the uvula and the labial mucosa are involved so this particular predilection for site uh, depends on uh, you know how you tend to use arachnid arachnid you know whether uh, it is just chewed as arachnid pieces or is it uh, used as a powder or uh, in you know, a paste or you know in, in combination with any other thing example uh, gutka mava misri whatever uh, you know you tend to choose that and place it against some particular area so if it is towards the buccal buccal mucosa that you place it then that area will be most affected if you tend to keep it a little more back then that particular area will be most affected and uh, some people tend to keep it in the labial mucosa between the teeth and the lips so that particular area will be more affected it all depends on what particular area you use but usually what happens is the patient keeps on chewing the arachnid pieces so you know most of the areas will be affected it can even be um, um, you know affecting the areas near the pharynx okay or pharyngeal region can also be affected there are uh, articles which suggest that you know people even swallow the juice the arachnid uh, you know after chewing so that means even the, the pharynx is also involved here. okay the symptoms can be uh, classified as early symptoms and late symptoms uh, early uh, signs include uh, blanching of the mucosa Uh, especially the buccal mucosa and the soft palatal region as well as the labial mucosa and you know, gradually it becomes a uh, white marble appearance which can be seen in the later stages where uh, you can see increased deposition of uh, collagen fibers so this but this particular appearance <coughs> excuse me is called as white marble appearance you can see that uh, the tongue is involved Uh, as well as the uvula the soft palate region all these regions are involved 
So what happens here is that the uvula uh, becomes a characteristic shape that is uh, it's called as a hockey stick appearance. It's also called as a J shaped appearance. Okay, so the uvula becomes shrunken and and that region becomes very stiff even your cheek flexibility is lost and then gradually uh, your tongue movements are also restricted and then uh, you 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 will find vertical bands on the buccal mucosa okay coming to the various stages uh, as described by balur in 1993 Mm, stage 1, uh, early OSMF, you find mild blanching, there is no restriction in mouth opening, no restriction in tongue protrusion and uh, you know, not much of effect on cheek flexibility. Burning sensation might be there but it only occurs on taking spicy food or hot liquids. Coming to the moderate stage, that is stage 2, there is a reduced mouth opening, setting of uh, burning sensation there are formation of palpable bands which can be elicited on the buccal mucosa, mucosa especially the partial area okay. then there is a lymphadenopathy and anemia because there is less of nutrition and then you know the restriction of uh, swallowing okay. this causes less intake of nutrients and then Anemia can be resulted. Okay. Uh, then coming to the severe OSMF stage, that is a stage 3, there is severe burning sensation, reduction in mouth opening, cheek flexibility, and tongue becomes gradually fixed. There could be ulcerative lesions, and the bands which I have mentioned earlier they become very thick okay, and very evident. And that is bilateral lymphadenopathy. There is another uh, staging by uh, Haider et al. who actually uh, gave a two pronged staging. That is uh, clinical staging and functional staging. Clinical staging can be uh, classified as grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3 uh, by the formation of bands. That is, in grade 1, you find only partial bands, in grade 2, only partial and buccal bands, whereas in grade 3, you find partial, buccal, as well as labial bands. These are vertical bands uh, due to collagen deposition, which you can be, uh, sorry, which you can elicit on the buccal mucosa by palpating. Okay. Then there is the functional stage, uh, which can be divided as uh, stage A, stage B, and stage C. There is, uh, sorry, which is stage A, uh, you have a mouth opening of uh, more than or equal to 20 millimeters. Whereas in stage B, you have a mouth opening of 11 to 19 millimeter, and stage 3, sorry, stage C, you have a mouth opening of uh, less than or equal to 10 millimeter. So both these stages are almost related to each other. You can you can actually observe that. So when there are bands, there is restriction. So when there are more bands, there is more restriction of mouth opening. Coming to the investigations. Uh, you can find that uh, the ESR levels are elevated, the serum iron stores are depleted, there is increased eosinophil count, immunoglobulin G, so the IgG is increased, mm, the pH in saliva is increased, salivary amylase is increased, alkaline phosphatase is also elevated as well as potassium, but the calcium levels are decreased. You can find hyperglobinemia, decreased vitamin B complex levels, and decreased protein levels. Coming to the management stage. So, as I told you, this is the stage, uh, you know, which is a little bit difficult. All the other stages is easy. That is the identification of the signs and symptoms, as well as you know, associating the particular uh, etiology with the disease. However, management is a little bit difficult. It's because, you know, patients come to you only after uh, there is severe limitation of mouth opening or, you know, the stage has become 
severe so when when that has occurred you cannot actually you know do justice to the treatment as such because you can only reduce the symptoms or you know you can only uh, give a little comfort and help to the patient or you cannot completely eliminate them okay so uh, so I'll, I'll be discussing the management steps the first step includes preventive measures that is if a patient comes to you with a habit of arachnid uh, chewing and use of tobacco and all those things we should tell him completely abstain from all that and you should also motivate the patient and inform about probable malignant transformation that itself will actually prevent the patient from further intake of all these harmful substances coming to the nutritional support part so you have to supplement the patient with iron vitamins minerals especially vitamin b and then antioxidants okay. so uh, regular uh, hemoglobin analysis should be done vitamin b deficiency as i told you could uh, lead to degenerative changes in the mucosa and lead to malignant transformation that is why vitamin b should be replenished okay antioxidants like lycopene uh, it inhibits the abnormal fibroblast production and stimulates the immune system okay so that also should be given coming to physiotherapy muscle stretching exercises should be encouraged so these include forceful uh, you know uh, stretching of your muscles okay, you can also ask the patient to blow balloons and hold it like that for some time so this actually helps to improve the cheek flexibility okay then uh, you can ask the patient to uh, use tongue blade uh, that is you know uh, you can stack tongue blades one upon the other so that the patient himself can analyze how much is his mouth opening so he should be encouraged to increase the number of tongue blades which will stack one upon the other so you know as the treatment progresses the patient can self monitor his uh, improvement you know that will be an encouragement for him okay. when there is uh, heat that is uh, this diatomy microwave diatomy and short wave diatomy where uh, uh, it's a selective heating of uh, extra epithelial connective tissue okay so by doing that you actually uh, help to uh, lyse the fibrous bands so this process is called as physiofibrinolysis of fibrous bands okay selectively heat the extra epithelial connective tissue and then coming to the immunomodulatory drugs the first uh, you know line of uh, immunomodulated drugs is obviously uh, steroids because you know it has a lot of beneficial effects first is obviously a reduction in inflammatory response okay so we can use it topically systemically or interrelationally depending upon the severity okay um, it also decreases the proliferation of fibroblasts and thus reducing the collagen fibers and helps to ingest the immovable collagen fibers okay. so uh, topical can be in the form of uh, gels or uh, ointments which can be applied to the particular lesion site systemic uh, you know it can be taken in and then it, it should be tapered down depending on the severity and interlesional is like injecting um, um, steroids into that particular lesion, especially near the band area. So, this could be done uh, alone or in combination with uh, other uh, drugs like, you know, maybe um, hyaluronidase, uh, which is uh, collagenase, which helps in lysis of the fibrous bands. Even placental extract can also be used along with. Okay, as I told you, placental extract. Okay, it comes by the brand name uh, Placentrix. Uh, it is uh, it is an aqueous extract of human placenta, uh, which contains nucleotides, enzymes, steroids, vitamins, and amino acids. It, it actually stimulates metabolic and regenerative activities. 
Mm, coming to levamazol, it is an immunomodulatory drug uh, which is you know, originally an anti-helminthic drug, but you know, if used in a different dosage, it acts as an immunomodulatory drug. Okay. Then there is uh, interferon gamma, which is known as uh, anti-fibrotic cytokine. Okay. It, it can also be given intralesionally and it improves the symptoms of poison. Okay, then uh, there is something which is called as an immune milk, uh, which contains anti-inflammatory components, which suppresses the in inflammatory process and stimulates cytokine production. So this is also used in poison treatment. Okay, and there are others like hyaluronic base. As I told you before, uh, this is a collagenase, which actually helps to lyse or break down the collagen fibers. Okay, it breaks down the hyaluronic acid in collagen fibers, and this is good. Then there's something which is called as chymotrypsin, which is an endopeptidase enzyme. It's a proteolytic agent, and it helps in preventing inflammation or reducing the inflammation. Then there are peripheral vasodilators. As I told you, there is obliteration of uh, blood vessels. So there are uh, peripheral vasodilators which actually help to dilate the blood vessels and improve the microcirculation. Uh, an example for this is pentoxifilin. Okay, so they are also called as rheologic modifiers. Okay, then um, yeah, there are other products like turmeric, which contains curcumin then aloe vera, green tea, etc., which has been really useful and you know, experimented a lot these days. It has been having very promising results. It has been used a lot now. When uh, you know, it is available in combination with steroids, you know, it comes by the name Cure Next. And then there is another uh, which is called as turbocot. It's, it's a combination of both uh, tramsinolone and uh, uh, curcumin. Okay. So as I told you, uh, you know, this is a particular disease where you know one size doesn't fit all. So you you need to combine several modalities. So you should uh, combine. Medis medicinal uh, management along with surgery. Sometimes you need to inject and then you need to physiologically uh, stimulate certain um, certain exercises. Okay. So, you know, if all these doesn't work, you need to go for the final part that is surgical management, which includes you know, minor breakage of uh, fibrous bands or if it's very severe, then you, know, you need to replace it with buccal pad of fat or something after removing all the fibrous and scar tissue. All those will be needed. So that comes under surgical management. That is actually beyond our domain. It's it's oral submucous fibrosis extreme stage. That will be managed by surgery department. Coming to the malignant potential, it has been noted that almost you know, 4.5 to 7.6 percent of uh, uh, OSMF turns into malignancy. Uh, as I told you before, the prognosis is uh, questionable it's because you actually get these patients only after the disease has progressed a lot. So you, you only tend to reduce or alleviate the condition. You don't actually completely remove the uh, problem. So the malignant potential as I told you, it is because of uh, the aricolin, okay, which is an alkaloid. It undergoes nitrosation and then it produces certain nitrosamines which damage the DNA and this continuous damage of the DNA is the cause for malignant transplant. So the patient should be avoided 
for the patient should be advised to avoid taking a paraclant as soon as you find it. Use all those things. Okay. So coming to the conclusion, again once again I like I would like to stress on the point. This particular disease is very easy to diagnose but extremely difficult to manage. It needs long term follow up and it is essential to detect dysplastic changes and malignant transformations. So you need to have this patient come to you for a long long time. So he needs to be motivated and encouraged on a regular basis. Okay. So with that I would like to wind up this session on OSMR. Thank you. Stay safe and stay enlightened.